Our next speaker will be Kahira O'Kane. So uh, we're interested in the biology of long axons and uh, axons can be uh, many orders of magnitude uh, longer than the diameter of the cell body uh, that they emanate from. Uh, it's a bit like if the cell body was the diameter of, of this uh, lecture theatre, uh, the axon could go all the way to perhaps New Orleans or Nashville or, or, or Virginia. So uh, that, that requires a lot of engineering to, uh, to keep it maintained in a good working order. And uh, you might expect diseases to result from that uh, if it's susceptible to, uh, to defects. And uh, you see that in her the hereditary spastic paraplegias where the longer uh, motor axons in the corticospinal tract are preferentially uh, susceptible to de degeneration. So we're interested really in two aspects of, of this. Firstly, um, using Drosophila to make predictions about uh, hereditary spastic paraplegia disease mechanisms uh, if we can study the uh, HSP genes in Drosophila, uh, but also conversely using HSP genetics to understand uh, the basic uh, biology of long axons. And, and the two goals really feed and support each other. So to understand mechanisms, uh, of course, often the first uh, step uh, in this is genetics. And uh, we're now in an area of gene discovery uh, for spastic paraplegia genes. Uh, there are around 70 cause of genes cloned uh, uh, so far, uh, and uh, I lose count because there's a new one appears in the literature once every month or two, mainly from exome sequencing. So at, um, at first sight, uh, there's um, uh, seemingly a wide range of proteins. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, as you might expect from the susceptibility of longer axons, affect um, axon transport uh, components, um, but a, a much larger number uh, encode proteins that are found on intracellular membranes and in two main locations, uh, en endosomes and on endoplasmic reticulum. And out of interest here, I've highlighted uh, in yellow uh, the, the genes that uh, have homologs in Drosophila, and the list is out of date. It's e expanding all, all the time. So uh, we, we've focused on um, a subset of these genes. Uh, it's around seven uh, proteins so far, um, but uh, a much larger fraction of the uh, mutations, uh, because most of the co a lot of the commonly found mutations are, uh, affect these proteins. And one feature that they have in common is um, uh, one or two intramembrane uh, hairpin structures that can insert. Uh, into the ER membrane, the cytosolic face of the ER membrane, thereby distorting it and inducing curvature. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in yeast, for example, uh, the reticulon uh, family, uh, R R uh, RTN, and the REAP family collectively are responsible for formation of most cortical ER tubules. If you knock out one family, uh, you don't have much of a phenotype. If you knock out the other family, there's not much of a phenotype um, but if you knock out both families, uh, you lose most cortical ER tubules in yeast. So our ma main question has been, what does ER curvature have to do with axon maintenance? And the strategy has been to um, uh, make or use Drosophila uh, mutants uh, in these genes uh, and uh, ask what uh, is the effect uh, of, of those genotypes on integrity of ER in axons. So. Uh, nearly every meeting I go to, someone asks me, is there ER in axons? Um, and there are reasons for that that I'll come on to in, in a minute. Uh, but uh, uh, if you look in the right way, it, it's easy to find. And this is a, a, an electron micrograph from 1976, um, uh, not quite before I was born, but before, before some of us were born, um, which shows uh, quite a big mammalian axon uh, that's, uh, that's full of um, uh, smooth ER. Uh, uh, tubular network. Uh, so this is the prep that we use for a lot of our work, uh, the dissected Drosophila uh, third and star larva, where you see at the, um, at the um, anterior side the brain lobes and the ventral nerve cord, um, and you have short motor axons going out to the anterior body wall segments. They're, they're transparent, so you can't really see them uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, with longer ones uh, going out to the posterior uh, one. So not quite the same scale of, of a problem as human axons, uh, but uh, still similar in, in principle. 
So, so the first uh, uh, family we looked at were the reticulons, and there are four reticulons in humans, uh, uh, two in flies. Which one should we be looking at? Uh, we have gone for reticulon one because um, it's widely expressed, whereas reticulon two is limited to testes and fat body. And in spite of the dendrogram, uh, it's not actually an ancient duplication. It's a very recent duplication um, in, in the, um, the dipteran uh, uh, lineage. Um, and it only looks so ancient because the reticulon two molecular clock is ticking very fast, and therefore it's not very constrained functionally. And therefore, um, focusing on the... On the um, uh, on the uh, most functionally constrained uh, uh, reticulum one, the most highly most widely expressed, uh, this is the one that uh, uh, we, we focused on. So first we looked at uh, cells where we could see some type of uh, uh, ER network, uh, and uh, these are larval epidermal cells. And if you look at confocal um, uh, of um, uh, uh, these cells using a KDL. Uh, classical ER marker. Uh, in, in wild type cells, you see some hint of an ER network. If you look in reticulon knockdown, and we see the same effect uh, in reticulon mutant, I haven't shown here, um, there's some loss of network uh, uh, organization. And if you look at, uh, uh, at EM level, uh, the, the most prominent phenotype you see is that ER sheets have become expanded, consistent with loss of curvature, uh, either at the end of ER sheets or perhaps with, with uh, uh, conversion of, of tubules to sheets. What about axons? The, um, the, the problem that we struggled with for quite a while was uh, seeing ER in axons, which is why I get asked that question so often. Uh, we, we try, this is an example uh, um, uh, here of, uh, of KDEL, uh, plenty of um, uh, staining in the, um, in the cell bodies, uh, not much in the neuropil, there's a little bit there, um, uh, but not much. And we found similar results for what most people call ER markers, until it occurred to us, we're looking at the wrong markers because uh, most proteins that people call ER markers are markers of protein export, protein traffic, protein folding, which is really rough ER. And uh, if you start looking for markers of smooth ER or tubular ER, they go very strongly into axons. And that's shown, for, that's shown by this uh, uh, reticulum Y of P exon trap, which goes very strongly into neuropil, and you can see it uh, uh, labeling clearly. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the nerves come out of the ventral nerve cord, and here uh, at the neuromuscular junction, um, uh, reticulum YFP going all the way to the terminal bit on in a nice uh, in a nice line. So we couldn't use reticulum YFP as uh, a marker for loss of reticulum function, uh, but um, we, we um, uh, found a binding partner, uh, ACSL, which is a, a long-chain fatty acyl CoA synthetase, so lipid biosynthesis consistent with what's known as the function of, of ER, uh, and that goes very strongly into axons as well. And we found both in, in um, a reticulon uh, uh, knockdown and reticulon mutant is that uh, in anterior motor axons closer to the cell body, there's no significant effect on that marker. Um, the, uh, the further you go to the posterior, uh, so sort of the further away from the cell body, you start to see some loss of that marker uh, from, from, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, from uh, the long motor axons, uh, analogous to what's happening in, in, in the disease. What about the reaps? Uh, there are six human reaps, six fly reaps, uh, at first sight, the phylogeny is a little bit confusing, but if you uh, focus on the, the members of the family that are slowly evolving and more widely expressed, then the phylogeny looks a lot simpler. Uh, we've got one that we call REAP A, an ortholog of human REAPs 1 to 4, another that we call REAP B, an ortholog of human REAPs uh, 5 to 6. And uh, uh, we look at uh, epidermal cells. Uh, again, uh, you see a similar uh, effect to loss of reticulon, uh, expansion of ER sheets, but only in the double loss of function, REAP A and, and REAP B. Um, but we don't see this phenotype in, in the, the single loss uh, of function. Um, uh, and uh, what about axons? Uh, we see um, uh, no effect of, of REAP A on ACSL levels in, in these axons. Uh, uh, but uh, in REAP-B mutants, uh, we see a similar effect to loss of reticulon. And the REAP-AB uh, double mutant, a similar effect uh, again. So there seems to be no effect of REAP-A either alone or uh, along with, uh, with REAP-B uh, in axons. The axonal phenotype seems to be due to loss of REAP-B. So what about the yeast, uh, the equivalent of the yeast genotype that's missing both families? So we made the, the, uh, the triple mutant, which is uh, equivalent to a tenfold mouse knockout. 
Um, and, um, and if you focus just on the central panels here, um, there are control genotypes uh, at, uh, at the top. And on this column here, uh, these three panels show examples of the types of phenotype. The phenotype is quite variable, but the most extreme end, we see uh, what looks like fragmentation of axonal ER, at least judged by this marker. Um, I haven't shown it here, but we know it's not fragmentation of axons because a plasma membrane marker um, uh, is not affected uh, in, in this way. And um, if we use reticular knockdown, uh, we see a similar effect as, as we do with the mutant as well. And we even see uh, a hint of, of that phenotype as well in reticular loss of function, but not as, uh, not, not as, uh, as strong. So um, what's happening um, uh, to ER, what's really happening to ER and axons, uh, and for this we had to go to EM level, and, um, and here uh, to be able to uh, see uh, ER tubules um, w without uh, all of the other uh, components of axons, we, we uh, collaboration with Mark Tarasaki at Yukon Health Center, uh, we labeled um, uh, or perhaps uh, these are peripheral nerves, the same as we do the confocals on. Uh, we label them with reduced osmium, uh, which preferentially stains membranes. And um, you can see plasma membranes very clearly. And almost every axon, you can see a few dots. The smaller uh, axons tend to have maybe one. Uh, the, uh, the larger axons tend to have more than one. And I'll show you in a couple of slides, but most of those dots are, are tubules because they're, uh, you can follow them from multiple sections uh, al al uh, along the axon. So what are the predictions you would make if you're losing these curvature-inducing proteins? You might predict higher diameter. And in fact, we see that the average diameter uh, increases from about 40 nanometers outer diameter to about, to about 60. Um, you might also predict fewer tubules. And, and we also see that as well, that, that, um, that uh, the, the, um, uh, the average number of ER tubules per axon um, uh, goes from about 1.6 to about 1, which means that there are a few axons uh, where, where we don't see any. Um, and so the, the, um, uh, the effect of that is that you still have a, uh, in, in wild type, you see a moderately extensive ER network uh, shown here in this reconstruction from, from different views, and we have a less extensive uh, ER network in, in mutant axons when we remove these curvature in, inducing proteins. And, um, and uh, the one thing that I hinted to as well is we also see occasional gaps in the network um, that uh, we don't see to the same extent in wild type. Um, and, and this is an example of a triple mutant uh, of four axons, uh, three of which you can follow, uh, for, for example, this dot uh, through. Um, uh, multiple sections, showing that it's uh, uh, a, a tubule going uh, all the way through, through uh, each 60 nanometer section. Um, but this is, this is an axon where there, there, these are probably two tubules, uh, but there are several sections, so uh, a couple of hundred nanometers uh, uh, without, uh, without uh, a tubule. Uh, it is striking, however, that most axons do still have a tubule, so although uh, I think we're, we're confident that we are starting to hit uh, proteins that are responsible for formation of ER tubules, there must be a lot of proteins there still that, that, are, that, are, that are responsible. So what could the functional consequences be? Um, uh, local um, uh, effects on axon physiology could be calcium homeostasis, lipid biosynthesis, coordination of organelles. Um, but another striking thing about ER is its physical continuity uh, along neurons, and it's been compared to a neuron within a neuron by, by, by Mike Berridge. And disruption of that continuity is an attractive hypothesis for uh, the basis for the disease, because it could explain why, why the, the um, uh, why um, uh, it's the longer axons that are pre preferentially susceptible because uh, a longer axon is more likely to have a gap somewhere in the network than, than, than a shorter one. So, um, so I'll finish there uh, and um, thank the people um, uh, that uh, did the work. Uh, Martin Stefanko, who himself and supervising a number of undergraduates made um, uh, most of the mutants and, uh, G and some of the GFP fusions. I talked about Neva Sullivan, uh, who did the initial work on, on um, the reticulon uh, phenotype. Belgen Yalcin, who did most of the, uh, the work I presented uh, as a PhD student on, on REAP uh, phenotypes and the triple mutant uh, phenotypes. And, and uh, uh, Lulu Lu Zhao, uh, who um, uh, has done the EM analysis. Um, thank uh, Mark Tarasaki and his uh, student technician Valentina, who actually did the uh, EM sections uh, uh, with us. Evan Reed uh, from Cambridge for introducing uh, me to these uh, diseases uh, about a decade ago, and Tom Valig, 
uh, who um, has um, uh, tirelessly funded and encouraged uh, the field. Thank you. Sorry, but in the interest of time, I think we have to go on.